Uh, and welcome to our complimentary webinar. And I want to really uh, tell you how pleased we are that so many have registered. We've actually received 125 registrations, which is excellent. That's the good news. The bad news is the system only has 101 seats. So we're hoping that the usual um, number of people have last minute conflicts. But regardless, the uh, entire webinar is being recorded and will be posted on our website in a, a week or po possibly two. So if uh, you or any of your colleagues um, are unable to get in, you're welcome to go there or just for your own uh, benefit, review them uh, later on. And I wanted to add also that uh, this topic is one that was brought to our attention as a recommendation uh, from students that attended our workshop. Once a year, we have a four-day you know, advanced workshop here in New England. Uh, and the students during that time frame um, suggested having something specific on these, these topics uh, on a workstation. So we've done that. And I um, want to also add as a matter of um, procedure here, we welcome questions. And I know that it's difficult for people to verbally ask questions with so many on the call. So uh, uh, please feel free to let me know. And you can do that. There's a, an area on your, on your dialog box that says raise hand. So if you hit the raise hand button, um, I'll be able to unmute your line so that you can talk directly with us. Uh, the other option is to enter a written question into the question box. And we will manage them as we go through the the presentation. So uh, those are the logistical things. And again, uh, thank you for joining us. Um, and then just briefly, um, we have a, a fun team of, of colleagues that were, have worked together for many years. And I think all of you know us. But I just wanted to emphasize that we enjoy some really interesting uh, activities with some great companies all around the world, many of them your companies. And uh, we provide strictly services. We, we don't sell products. And with that, I'd like to introduce Ginger, who is going to be presenting today, Ginger Hansel. I suspect many of you know her. Um, she's a treasured asset of our team and uh, was the head of the, uh, motor, the ESD program for Motorola when she was there. And she is currently the senior vice president of the ESD Association. And our team uh, continues to enjoy helping and supporting the association. And with that, Ginger, I'm going to uh, turn it over to you. OK. Thank you, Ted. Um, so as, as Ted said, we've gotten a lot of questions for workstations, how to set them up, um, practical considerations. Uh, do's and don'ts. And I was at Motorola for over 24 years and I've been consulting for over 12 years. So I've seen a lot of workstations. <clears throat> and we've realized in putting this together that the workstation is kind of the basis of a good ESD control program. So the, the tricky thing about the presentation here is that the, Ted is running the slides. And so I may end up having to say next so he knows when we go to the next slide. One of the reasons we're doing this is he wants to share, we want to share a video at one point, a short video. Next. There, now we have the agenda. So basically we're going to start out by talking about what, what does a workstation provide in, in the work area for an ESD control program and give you some practical considerations. Um, obviously, selecting a work surface is important. I need to plan a, a keep away zone so any static uh, generators are not near sensitive product. And then you have to ground the people that work at that workstation. 
And there are many different ways to ground people. And also we will touch on, uh, you use garments for grounding. Uh, or if chairs are part of the program, the, handler, the handling containers and the tools that are used are very key to uh, think about as you uh, put them on the work surface, how the charge will be drained off them, what kind of materials you select, and also is there a role for ionization. So I, I think um, we'll have a pretty good sweep of information here and look forward to any feedback, uh, comments, or questions from you about uh, this overview of workstations. Uh, next slide. Um, the, the ESD Association has a, a good array of standards of how to do measurements. The, there's a technical report, TR53. It talks about all the different um, measurements that are needed to do compliance verification of the different materials and setups that we will be discussing. We don't have time in this particular presentation to uh, touch on that, but I wanted to reference that document for you. Next. So just as a, a reminder and a place to start, uh, ESD is a spark. Uh, most people have a sense of it. Uh, on a cold, dry day, they've, they've shocked themselves reaching for a doorknob or uh, taking a sweater off. <clears throat> what the thing uh, to emphasize is that it's the D in ESD. It's the discharge that does the damage. Uh, electrostatic are very useful, and if, the, if it's static and just sitting there, it's not a problem. But when it moves quickly, it can cause damage to sensitive products and devices. And oftentimes that damage can be caused uh, with a level that's very low that, that you're not aware of. <clears throat> Here's a, a list that gives you an idea that if you actually feel a spark, it's, it's over 2,000 volts. And sometimes you can see it. You know, if it's in a dark room, you reach for a doorknob, you can see a spark. Usually I get that when I throw the cat off the bed. Um, and you can hear it, uh, that, then it's much higher. But many devices are sensitive at the human body model uh, down to even one volt. So it's very important to follow the procedures to protect against ESD damage, even if you don't think you're creating any damage. So what is an ESD control workstation? Um, the, the definition is that it's a defined area where unprotected devices, and this means devices that are not in a protective uh, packaging or a case, um, they're susceptible or components or assemblies of, of sensitive devices. If they can be handled safely during production or if you're doing repair or field service work, then that is an ESD control workstation. And the main purpose is to provide a path to ground for the people working at the station and any items that are put on the surface. So we're going to talk about a couple of types of workstation. Often, you generally think of it as being like a workbench or a table. But there are standing workstations. There are carts, shelves. Sometimes it's a microphone, micro, microscope platform. Um, if you're doing field service work. So basically, any work surface for unexposed devices, components, or boards. So let's have some fun questions for workstations. Um, if a train stops at a train station, click, yeah, and a bus stops at a bus station, Will work stop at a workstation? So I couldn't help but think about this as we were putting the presentation together, because often work does stop there. But we're going to move forward and, and create a good workstation where work can get done. So in this drawing, you can see a um, standard idealized workstation. You've got um, a format that's connected to the ground, the common point ground. You have the table mat, you have even a protective mat that could be on a shelf or on a microscope stand. There's a location there in the front for the wrist strap to be connected. 
And if you notice the green arrows coming away from that common point ground, uh, they can either be connected to the equipment ground, which is preferred, or to the auxiliary ground if you can't connect to a, a electrical equipment ground. And the reason for using equipment ground is it's much easier to um, verify and test. And the point made there at the bottom of the slide is if everything in the workstation, including the people, are all connected to common point ground, if for some reason your contact to the electrical ground is broken, you still have an equipotential bonding. Everything is connected together at that station. So you would still have a robust grounding. It's you know, not recommended to work like that for a long period of time, unless you're doing field service work. But that gives you an added level of protection if everything is connected to that one common point ground. Ginger, I just want to add a quick thought. You reminded me of something. The uh -huh. um, auxiliary ground generally I mean, works fine for most applications. But um, when you get into extreme sensitivities, you know, deep into the, the class zero region, especially those one volt devices that you mentioned earlier, the auxiliary ground uh, can have enough uh, of a voltage differential or noise or ground loops. They have actually been the root cause of some uh, ESD failures of extremely sensitive uh, devices. That's a very good, very good point, Ted. Um, on, you know, some countries don't have three-wire grounding. They only have um, two wires, so it's harder for them to connect to electrical ground. But if you have a choice, electrical ground is the way to go. So are workstations set up to protect against human body model or charge device model? Um, so uh, charge, human body model uh, is basically approximates the discharge from a typical human being, which nobody's typical, uh, to the pin of a device with another pin grounded. So that's the model that we talk about in all of our standards for human body model. Generally, we think of it as if a person's charged and they reached over and touched uh, a sensitive device, they could just damage it. The charge device model approximates discharge from a charge component to a lower potential object through a signal pin or a terminal. The charge device model is normally thought of as the device is charged up and it hits a ground. Uh, hits, it's metal to metal discharge. And so when you think about a workstation, trying to think about, well, what, what is its main role for protection? And both are important. So we will look at, at that as we go through here. So here's some criteria on how to um, think about what kind of material you're going to put on a, uh, on a workstation. Um, first of all, be nice if it's uh, smooth, easy to clean. And it's com you want it to be compatible with the products. If you're moving heavy totes around, you might need something that you can slide uh, the totes. If you've got delicate uh, assemblies, you, you would want a soft mat so they'd be less likely to be damaged. You want it to be reliably grounded. Uh, this sounds obvious, but with some materials, it's more difficult to make contact to the, to the ground uh, with them. And I'll show you a picture in a minute. I want to select a material that you can you can test, and you may have some special um, applications. Of, for example, if you have soldering irons, you there are mats. Uh, rubber mats tend to resist burning from soldering irons. If you're in a clean room, you want to make sure the mat isn't outgassing or sloughing off particles, and as Ted mentioned, if you have class zero or very sensitive devices, you want to make sure that the mat will provide the protection for them. And so part of that has to do with the human body model and charge device model protection. If you have a dissipative surface that will drain the charge away slowly, then that also provides charge device model protection. And if you're going to cover the work surface, you want to make it something that 
the people that work there will accept. And we recommend that you set up a trial workstation and test it with all the materials to make sure that the properties uh, meet your needs before you replicate it throughout your facility. Next. Uh, Ginger, we just had a pertinent question to the grounding discussion. Uh -huh. uh, this is, question is, um, is, is a dedicated earth ground independent of and isolated from electrical and building ground acceptable as the primary ground for a workstation or for workstations? The answer is yes, it's acceptable, but it is not preferred. Using equipment AC electrical ground is the preferred method. And as we said a minute ago, it um, using an auxiliary ground has been known to cause damage to extremely sensitive devices. It's, it's not a common occurrence, but something to be mindful of as we go forward with the uh, technology and the greater sensitivities. And then, you know, the auxiliary, auxiliary ground question is um, one to think about if that's your option. I know one facility that we did an assessment, the auxiliary ground was uh, run along with the internet cables in a cable tray and the people that deal with the computers weren't as um, focused on keeping the ground connection connected as the electricians are when they are messing with equipment. So if you can use the electrical ground uh, um, whenever equipment is, is and, and of course you have to make sure that the, the, the ground point is wired correctly. Sometimes that's not the case. But generally the electricians have set up the uh, electrical ground properly and if you can connect to it, then you can test to any outlet anywhere. It makes it very easy to do your compliance verification. But thanks for the question because it, it is acceptable but not ideal. We have another good question here. What MAT characteristics make them suitable for class zero applications? And actually, we're going to get into that a little bit later when we talk yep, about next, it. Next slide, I think, when we're also going to show a short video that will bring home the point about being able to safely drain off charge. OK, so <clears throat> I have uh, some of the practical considerations and, and pitfalls. Um, first, it's always practical to be cost effective. It's not necessary to buy an expensive uh, ESD work surface. You can get just a basic work table and put a mat on it and get just as good a protection. There are many types of work surfaces. Um, you, you can have rubber, vinyl, uh, an ESD laminate, that's like a hard laminate, or metal. Some of the mats have multiple layers. You can have a one layer, two layer, three layer. <laughs> Probably even more. Uh, some of them are like a sandwich. It can make it difficult to connect to the uh, conductive inner layer um, if you have a multi-layer mat. But, um, a soft mat provides a, a, a conformal surface. It's easier to make uh, contact, complete contact, to drain charge off of a hard, uh, like a hard tote or a circuit board. And that is what we were talking about for uh, class zero. And we have a short video that Ted is going to switch over and play. Yes, and let me just add that uh, the showing videos through this um, process. In this video, uh, we'll see the difference in charge case, removal between hard tabletops and soft mats and discuss the difference this makes to an ESD control program. Yeah. To measure this difference, we so start with a beta, conductive metal disc with an insulating handle so and a plastic Ted disc that's used to charge it. Of, uh, we also use a field glass. meter to measure the voltage on the disc. On when we place the disc on, on a hard, hard dissipative surface, tabletop, we measure a problem in thousand volts and the charge decays very slowly. Okay, and what if you leave it a little longer, like five seconds or something? There? Okay. By contrast, when we place the disc on a soft dissipative mat, the there. charge is drained off almost instantly. Let's examine why this difference occurs. If we were to look at the electrical contact microscopically, we would see that the hard surface contact in only a few places, making charge transfer slow and inefficient.
Muted. By contrast, the soft mat flattens to make nearly continuous contact, allowing rapid charge removal. Note that the disc is at approximately 6,000 volts before oh, and it, after contact you can't hear with the, the hard the tabletop. Audio and the By contrast, video, the I'll voltage drops quickly to zero as there. soon as it makes contact and with the soft mat. Back, be able to see it. Um, Not done. Okay. So, Okay. Pretty much the same process. It's dramatically better. That's why uh, there's a question in the survey about specifying soft materials yeah. very rapidly. From a practical but if he places it on soft a table soft mats have mat, because it makes better contact, uh, because the soft mat conforms to the surface, the charge does drain away much quicker. Hey, we're back. So, um, Ted, are you there? I can't hear you, Ted. I think, uh, Ted, we can go on and we can try I'm and back. show the bit. Sorry, Are you back? back. We, yep. We can we we could show the video towards the end so it doesn't uh, disconnect us again. Okay, but I think yeah. I I tried to explain the gist of of the video is you know two hard surfaces making contact. There, it it you'd think they were touching very easily, but they they are you know the surface really has bumps on it and and little imperfections. So you don't make as good a contact as putting a a smooth hard surface down on a soft mat. So the next next slide, Ted. So grounding, as we've discussed, is is a real consideration. That's what provides a human body model protection um, because it drains the charge away from the people at the workstation at, as they're doing the work. A dissipative surface is the safe controlled charge removal so that if you put a sensitive device down, it drains uh, slowly of any charge instead of a sudden discharge. Now stainless steel is often thought of as a work surface. Uh, it's very clean. It's great in clean rooms. Uh, 2020 does uh, allow for stainless steel tabletops. In our experience, the stainless steel provide, uh, poses too great of a charged device model risk because if you place a charged circuit board or a device on a stainless steel tabletop, it'll discharge so quickly that it could be damaged. And so if for some reason you have a, a room with uh, stainless steel tables, either containerize the product, handle them in their shipping packaging so they're protected, or cover the bench, uh, put a, a dissipative mat on top of the bench. This is a diagram showing the difficulty of connecting to the conductive buried layer. This is a, a laminate, a laminated bench top, but the same is true for some of the um, multi-layer work mats. Uh, as you see, there's a, a dissipative work surface on the top. This is put on top of a, a, bench, a wooden bench. And the middle layer is rather thin, but that's the conductive layer. And you may wonder why there are two bolts going through there. Uh, one reason is that gives you twice as many opportunities to connect to the conductive layer. The other reason is you're able to test that you're actually connected, because you can test for continuity between those two bolts. And one thing about hard laminates, uh, they do expand and contract with humidity. So sometimes the connection may be better than other times. So this, these pictures are of the same mat. We're measuring the top over on the right. As you see, it is very dissipative. It's uh, uh, 5.6 times uh, 10 to the 6. That is right in the dissipative range, a very good range for a work surface. 
and the bottom of the mat, so this is just a two-layer mat, the bottom is actually conductive. So the snap connector on this type of mat goes through the corner and has prongs that spread out in a star shape and make very good contact with the conductive layer. This mat is a single layer mat. It is all of a dissipative material, which means as you're connecting the ground, you're relying on the dissipative material touching the uh, ground uh, snap. And the material uh, doesn't, isn't permanently dissipative in this case. It does age. And so it has moved to the point where it's out of specification. According to 2020, a mat should be less than 1 times 10 to the ninth. And this is a little more. So there's a shelf life. And this type of mat does not have that conductive layer that we mentioned uh, that you really need uh, for good grounding. There's a related question here, Ginger. The question is, yes. is there a general benefit to more layers? Uh, three generally better than two, two generally better than one. Um, I can take a stab at this. I think the key thing is at least two layers so that you have that conductive scrim layer below the surface to optimize the efficiency <clears throat> of both grounding and charge removal. The third layer um, is is often there for physical reasons. Beyond that, though, uh, the key thing is to have the conductive layer below, you know, at least two layers. The reason uh, the, the two-layer one, if, it, if you can tell that you're connected to that, the only drawback with the two-layer mat is sometimes we see them put down upside down. And now people are working on a conductive surface. So they have to be installed properly. And I'll just add, Ginger, that we have a couple of other questions that we'll handle at the end. They're a little off topic, but good questions. OK. So now let's look at workstation grounding. Next. Yep. Momentarily. There it goes. <laughs> I feel like I need to make a little beep. Well, I've been told repeatedly so, by my wife that I cannot multitask. When I'm reading questions and trying to advance slides, I get lost. <laughs> you're Sorry, you're doing that. fine. Yeah. So w when you're grounding a workstation, it's important to think about putting the ground points in a convenient location. Uh, you want them easily visible for uh, an audit. Uh, visual inspection is a very powerful way to just scan and make sure things are connected. You want them accessible so you can get there and do testing. If you have a common point ground, you want room to be able to add new connections. You may decide you need to put a mat on a shelf, uh, or you may need to ground a piece of equipment. So you want enough room to add other connections. It's important to have them where it's easy to maintain and out of harm's way. I wanted to point out on this uh, wrist strap connecting connection, it is under the edge of the table. And that, and it, instead of the banana plug sticking straight out, it's actually got a right angle. So it's less likely to get bumped by somebody's kneecap or, and knocked around. And it's generally out of harm's way. So that's a, that's a good location. And these, these can be put at different ends of the, of the work surface, in case you have right and left handed people and that sort of thing, or additional workers. So, um, the, also on this workbench, you'll notice that the front of the table is rolled. Uh, it's much more convenient and comfortable for people working there because you will end up resting your wrist, and nobody likes to rest your arm, forearm on a sharp corner. So these are just not necessarily ESD controls, but ergonomics makes it easier to work there. Another pertinent question, um, can, a, can damage to the mat, such as cuts or burns, affect the um, dissipative characteristics of the mat. And I would say it depends, but certainly it, it's a possibility. Uh, burns could compromise the electrical properties at the surface in the immediate contact area. Uh, the other possibility is that if cuts were to separate the body of the mat from the ground connection, then that could be problematic. So it would be a case by case determination. And that's and that's a very good question. So when you're testing uh, resistance to ground, 
an ideal location is to put the five pound weight at the work surface where the, the main where the most of the work is being done because if the mat's gotten dirty or uh, sometimes people put tape down for various reasons you know so they know what things belong in different locations the tape could be insulating um, a lot of times people store things underneath mats which can also isolate if you're relying on the mat touching stainless steel to be grounded um, so those are some things to think about when you set up a, works, a workstation. Now this picture shows a comma point ground with a lot of room to grow. You can connect different, other, if you have to put additional mats or uh, ground points, you can connect to that. It's also wired into the power strip. The power strip's right off on the left. So this, at the back of this workbench, they had a power strip mounted to plug in all the different equipment. And this is wired right in there. Um, that way it can't really be removed, accidentally unplugged, and you know that it's, um, it's uh, easy to test because you can just test the ground. Now if you don't have a work surface because you're doing field repairs or uh, mobile, uh, there are fold-out mats that you can use where you can connect your person and your equipment put any sensitive boards that you're installing on the mat so everything is connected together. It may not be going to electrical ground or, or an alternative ground, but since everything is commonly connected, then you can't have a difference of potential that would damage the devices. Now, this is a, a picture of what we call a daisy chain, where one workstation is connected to the next workstation, to the, connected to the next one. I, it, it seems like it's easier to do that, but if one wire is broken, this whole row of workstations are now disconnected from ground. So connect each workstation directly to ground and don't daisy chain them together. Now, here's a, here's a workstation for you. Um, what's wrong with this picture? Um, the first thing you may notice is the uh, worker is not using the workstation, work surface at all. It's too full of static generators. <laughs> uh, one of the uh, components uh, in 2020 is that any uh, static generator should be kept 12 inches away from static sensitive devices. So that means the styrofoam on the table, the tape dispenser, all that stuff that's in the way should be back and off that, that work surface so that there is room to put the sensitive board on the table and have it grounded and do work there. Also, I don't believe this worker is uh, grounded. So this is a great example of everything not to do. So let's talk about personnel grounding. Um, wrist straps are the first uh, line of defense for human body model with seated people. Um, most people are aware of the wrist strap and we're going <clears> to <throat> talk a minute about them. Uh, you'll see here, on, excuse me, before you go to the next slide, Ted, there's a, off on the left, there's a, a cloth uh, band and there's a metal band. The cloth bands are cheaper. They wear out quicker. They tend to get dirty. A lot of times the conductive fibers in there can break. So the, the metal bands we've found in our experience, they, they hold up better. We have a, a question, Ginger, here related to the 12-inch rule and how it came to be. And I just wanted to say that it was you know, originally, well, it was originally it was three, I think it was a meter, three feet in military standards. That was impracticable. You just you couldn't manage it. It was not totally unrealistic. Uh, Twelve inches is more manageable, can be difficult, and there was uh, some testing done to show that the field strength from a, a static generating material, uh, twelve inches away, is unless it's you know it's virtually no risk at all. So the twelve inches gives you a safe demargin, uh, and it's more manageable. Uh, at the workplace. Yep, thank you. That's, that's very good. So we have, uh, since constant monitors have become more 
in use, we, we talk about the unmonitored wrist straps and the monitored ones. So for unmonitored ones, just make sure there's a convenient banana jack. Of course, if they're unmonitored at the workstation, they need to be tested um, as people enter the work area. Uh, make sure you thought about the, some people are right-handed and some are left-handed. And sometimes a manager or a visitor or another employee needs to use that bench, so make sure there's enough ground points. The banana plugs themselves can wear out. The little uh, springs that keep them in the plug can get fatigued. There are some designs that are more robust. And as we said, the cloth wristbands are less reliable and to locate it out of harm's way. So that it, tends not to get disconnected. Another great pertinent question, Ginger. Uh, does the metal strap pose a CDM hazard in class zero environments? Uh, excellent observation, and the avoidance of metal is, is and metal to metal contact is critical for CDM. Uh, right. The metal wristbands have a an insulated outer surface. In fact, there's a the association standard requires that. So the only exposed metal is uh, at the wrist interface. And that's also good uh, for safety. You don't want people running around with electric, electrical equipment with metal um, bands that they could touch. <clears throat> OK, so constant monitors, uh, there are two main kinds, a resistance type and an impedance type. Uh, they do. <clears throat> work very well. Um, one of the things is that uh, if you you want the alarms loud enough to hear, which in some work areas that can be an issue, and it does give customers a sense of confidence when they come and tour your facility because they see that everybody is being monitored all the time. If a band goes bad in the middle of the morning, you don't have to wait until the worker comes back into the test area and, get, and test again to find it. So that's important. Sometimes uh, just because you don't hear an alarm doesn't mean that it's actually grounding the people. Sometimes uh, they have become unplugged because people get tired of listening to alarms. So they find ways to make the alarm stop. So that is something that needs to be verified. And you still need to manually test the wrist straps to make sure that they're working, but just maybe not as frequently because they are being tested all the time. Now, a single wire, the impedance type, um, may not pick up an intermittent failure that's a little slower to react. And so if your wristband is not making very good contact with the worker, then you may not know that. You may think it's still fine because there's a time delay. So that's why manual checking is very important, especially if you're using a cloth, cloth wristband. <clears throat> so here's an example. Um, there's a, you can see the cloth wristband on the operator's uh, hand there. And notice she's taken her glove off in order to press the test. She want, has to make contact with that button. and and it's failing. The red light's on. And the, <clears throat> the reason, as we pointed out, the um, filaments in the wristband, the threads, are have, have a very short life. Uh, they can fray. They can get dirty. And so if the cord is connected to the metal plate. And the metal plate, as long as it's touching the person, will ground the person. But sometimes bands are stretch it out, or they're worn too loosely. And that's when you get that intermittent type of uh, failure. And it's generally invisible unless you're using a, a, some equipment called an event detector, and you notice events at different times at a, a workstation. And you can sometimes trace that to the fact that the wristband was intermittent. We found quite a few bad wrist straps using event detectors. Uh, a couple of related questions. Uh, mm -hmm. Constant monitors, you, I see, constant monitors usually monitor wristbands and workbench services. What potential pitfalls can exist if you place all of your faith in the monitor? Um, I, I guess the key thing is to know whether your monitors 
you really fully understand how they operate, characterize them, and go beyond the standard me measurements. You measure body voltage while you're uh, you know, having people do some exaggerated movements to, to, as you qualify the equipment. Um, the other thing is you can get uh, you know, these unreported failures. We see that from time to time. This picture that Ginger is showing now, uh, as she said, we get events uh, with people wearing this type of wristband. And the monitor for a single wire uh, sometimes does not react quickly enough to report the failures. So you've got to be a little careful, but uh, prudent engineering should get you by that issue. It's important to know the, the pitfalls so you know what to look for um, when you're when you're setting up when you're choosing your materials because often there are trade-offs. Nothing's perfect. Um, you know, there's also cost impact. So we're trying to uh, alert you to some things to think about as you're making those decisions. We have a wisecrack here, uh, Ginger. Have you found a good wireless wrist strap? <laughs> This is a, a mythical, mythical being. Unfortunately, some people do put their uh, faith in them. Uh, for ESD control, of, uh, and you're trying to protect sensitive devices, there is no wireless uh, situation that will get you down to the low levels that you need to handle um, sensitive uh, components. So uh, wireless wrist strap may help you in a high voltage environment, you know, that you're just trying to get your voltage down from, say, 50,000 to 5,000, that's not going to help you with handling devices. And it's unfortunate, but we have seen factories where people are happily wearing their wireless wrist straps and think they're protected, and they are not. Another question is, do gloves compromise the uh, performance of wrist strap grounding? If the wristband is on the outside of the glove, it's not making contact to the person. Um, gloves are can be problematic if you don't need gloves. Some people think they need gloves for ESD control. Gloves are not good for ESD control. Gloves are good for keeping finger oil off of things. Um, so if there's reasons that you need to use gloves, then you have to carefully select gloves. We don't really go into gloves in this presentation, um, but if you can do your job without introducing another variable, without introducing gloves, it's much preferable. Uh, another question. Uh, if, if an operator must wear a glove because of the operation, is it appropriate to test the glove, um, to test the wrist strap without the glove as pictured here? It's difficult to actually connect to the testing equipment with the glove on unless the glove is very conductive. Uh, Do you have something question. else to add there, Ted? Um, I think that one way I like to you know, emphasize it is that wrist strap checkers are wrist strap checkers, not glove checkers. <laughs> That's so, good. Um, if you're testing a glove, you'll, you could very well fail the wrist strap test, even though the person is well grounded. Uh, so sometimes you have to have bare skin on the wrist strap testing equipment. The, the glove itself is a problem. We, we have yet to see a glove that uh, is really, really safe to use. They all charge the product. Uh, let's see. I'd love to go on with these questions all day, but I want to make sure we finish the uh, presentation. And I think we're on track to do just that. Um, let's let's go ahead, Ginger. I'll... Okay. So now we're going to talk about footwear because if you may be in a, a standing or walking operation where having a wrist strap is is not a good option. So ESD control footwear on an ESD floor, you got to have both, can be very effective. Um, shoes last longer than foot straps. They do cost more. Um, they, uh, the, the pro, another pro with using shoes is that most people know how, or, how to put their shoes on. You don't have to spend a lot of time training them. <clears throat> it, the con is that you need a place to store the shoes. And often when 
people put the shoes on, they need to wait about 10 minutes before they can test them. You need to get a good, uh, a little bit of a sweat layer between the person and the shoe to make good contact so that they will pass the test. Uh, sole grounders are also an option that cover the bottom of a, of a shoe as opposed to just a heel strap. They do provide a lower walking voltage. Uh, they, they cover a bigger surface of the foot. And they are less likely to get uh, kicked out of, out of, out of place um, than just something across the back of a heel. So here's a picture. Uh, a common misconception is that the conductive ribbon on a heel strap needs to touch skin. It actually is better if it does not, if it goes under, between the sock and the inside of the shoe. It goes under the foot. You get there's inevitably there's a sweat layer. The person can make better contact. Uh, the ankle skin is generally pretty dry, and socks can be loose. So just tucking it in the top of the sock like this is not recommended. It's very difficult to pass on a wrist on a heel strap tester with this kind of um, uh, technique. Ginger, we have a couple of hands raised to ask a question verbally. Let me. Give that a shot. Uh, George, uh, let me just see if I got you unmuted there. George Gear, you uh, are on the air. Hello? Maybe he has his phone on mute. Well, he may have changed his mind, too. We may have answered it earlier, so let's, let's proceed. OK. So here's an example where you can see the left foot, uh, the heel strap has been scuffed off the back of the shoe. And the person was walking along merrily across the floor carrying a circuit board. And he was only grounded every, with every other foot, every other step. So you can get quite a lot of charge buildup in that time period. I do want to point out that the right foot has the ground ribbon going over the shoe, under the foot, so not inside the sock, but between the sock and the shoe. And that's a very good location. It's also easier to put on. You can just tuck it in under the sole of the foot so you're basically stepping on the ribbon. And that makes it a good contact. So I want to emphasize the need for footwear testers. You, you can see on the left there are two panels. That's because you want to touch, test each foot individually, make sure they're both working. And on the right, you, there are ways you can just set it up on a, uh, a metal plate and test it using a, a resistance meter. Uh, be sure and test both feet. Flooring systems. As we've said, flooring is very key if you're going to use footwear. You do want to test and make sure that the floor is connected to ground. This is a resistance to ground test. But it's a very important to do periodic walking voltage testing to verify that the footwear in conjunction with the floor is working. Here's an example where we did some testing. And it was a good floor. It was uh, 10 to the 8th. The shoes were good. They, they were, the resistance was uh, 10 to the 7th, 1 times 10 to the 7th. However, in combination, while walking across the floor, we measured a, a peak of up to um, 413 volts. And doing the uh, six sigma analysis, um, the three sigma, there was a potential to generate over 673 volts uh, just walking on, with a good, good heel strap on a good floor. It turns out the problem was that a layer of regular wax had been put on the floor. So the floor still uh, measured good, but the surface contact properties had changed such that there was charging that occurred. Sometimes uh, there's a need for uh, the, if you're sitting down, uh, wrist strap wires can get tangled on equipment, can get tangled in, on sensitive things. And so sometimes you don't want to have wires around. And so that is one reason people will use a garment. 
I'd like to highlight, if you need a garment for other reasons in your area than ESD control, you can sometimes just buy a regular garment. You don't always need an ESD control garment in special washing conditions. Um, but if you are using an ESD garment for various reasons, um, you can relocate the wire um, away from the work surface. One way is they have a snap at the, at the waist so that the, you're connecting there and not people's arms are free. Um, we recommend that um, a wrist strap is still the best choice. You can get one with a very long wire and thread the wire through the sleeve of the garment and have it come out at the waist. And just to keep the dangling wires off the work surface, that is a good solution. But the uh, grounding simply the garment to a, uh, it doesn't always connect to the person. Uh, Ginger, just a comment. Go ahead. I'm go sorry. Ahead. Uh, I was going to say one of the uh, comments we just received is that uh, torso straps tucked uh, inside the belt seem to be effective. I've never done an exhaustive characterization of that, but uh, it's possible. You know, I want to do be sure to do walking voltage measurements, you know, continuous measurements, and do a lot of data gathering uh, before I would want to approve it. But it, I have seen it in use and uh, could very well be effective. That's that's the fun thing about ESD control is there are many variables and you always there are always unique solutions and that's why consulting never gets boring. It's always amazing the creative uh, approaches people take to solve problems once they understand the underlying physics of what they're trying to do. This a slide shows you the problem with just relying on a garment. Um, people get chilly; they can wear a long sleeve shirt. And this particular garment is relying on the wristband touching the, the worker's skin to make contact. And here, it's clearly not. So the person was not grounded. And of course, that's just one of many ways these uh, gar grounding through garments uh, have been known to break down. So chairs are another um, item that can be added. Uh, to your arsenal of, uh, for controlling ESD. Often this is not an ESD program requirement, uh, but it is a good insurance element. It can give you another layer of, of uh, confidence that charges aren't building up in the area. Of course, you have to have an ESD flooring, and we recommend the ESD casters on the, on the chairs. Just having a drag chain is really not a robust enough connection. One thing to put keep in mind is you don't have to replace every chair in your area all at once. You can just change the requirements so all new chairs that are bought are ESD chairs, and then over time you will have this extra element of protection. And by the same token, don't add it to your ESD control program. It can be sort of a, your your hidden insurance policy. And, and but do. Do keep it in the audit plan to make sure you're testing that the chairs are still working. Uh, related question, how do you measure the back of the chair per TR-53? As I'd have to double check this, but as I recall, TR-53 does not specify testing the back of the chair. It's really a simple test to the seat. But if anybody knows differently, please um, send a message. Yeah, I mean, it, when you're qualifying the chair, I would test everything. You know, I would hold that uh, five-pound weight up against the back and test it. I would test the armrest. I would make everything sure everything's connected for my own confidence before I specify a chair. Um, also, select one that's got a relatively low resistance to ground to begin with because these will age, get a lot of abuse, um, you know, a lot of use. And so if you select one that's already that's down at 10 to the 6, 10 to the 7th, as the, if the resistance increases uh, with age, you're still well within your, um, your range of effective control. Mm -hmm. and, and the casters will need to be cleaned. Uh, even clean rooms can have dust bunnies. Not big ones, of course. Clean dust bunnies. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So uh, the containers and, and tools. This is very important because every work surface ha 
has some kind of container or tool. Uh, there are, when we've talked about conductive and dissipative and insulative, that is a range indicating how uh, fast a charge would move on that surface. A con conductive can be anything from metal, which has zero resistance, up to um, 10 to the fourth. So that could be like a black carbon or some kind of material that is fairly conductive. It's not as conductive as metal, but could be damaging. You could drain a charge too fast for the good of the sensitive device. Dissipative is kind of like, you know, it's kind of like the story of Goldilocks where everything is just right. Dissipative is kind of that range that you want things for charge device model protection because if anything becomes charged, it'll be drained uh, in a careful manner. And then insulative, insulators are things that charge up. Charge does not move away on an insulator very fast at all. It may dissipate over days or weeks, depending on the humidity, but it's way too slow for ESD control. We just got a response from headquarters, Ginger, on the TR-53 issue. And the comment is that TR-53 is for compliance verification only, which is why it's a simple seat-only test. Um, there is a standard STM 12.1 that contains uh, test methods for acceptance and qualification, which would include the full set of tests. That's excellent. Good to have ESD headquarters on the line, it's the ESD Association. And that's, if you have any questions about standards or additional training or other materials, contact the ESD Association. And there's a lot of good reference on their website as well. Another question about ESD chairs. Um, are they still effective if they're used in conjunction with, um, let's say, are ESD chairs still effective when not used in conjunction with an ESD floor? Um, it, you, know, you really need the full ground pass for them to give you optimal performance. And chairs tend to be an insurance component in the program. Uh, Non-ESD chairs, are they a threat? Uh, not typically. Uh, it, have to, it would be an unusual scenario. It's more that chairs provide that, that backup grounding if somebody forgets their wrist strap, uh, et cetera, and they're on an ESD floor. If you don't have a complete ESD floor, if you have an ESD mat you want to put under the chair, like perhaps you have one workstation where you're going to be doing um, uh, very sensitive or, or, or new components that are quite expensive and you want to give it that extra layer, you can put a, a mat down on the floor that, and grab the mat and then put the chair on the mat and that gives you another, another possible avenue because ESD floors are expensive and you probably aren't going to install one unless you need it. It is important to point out even some warehouses, you know, if there's concrete flooring, chances are that that will be somewhat conductive because concrete tends to absorb moisture and an ESD floor on a concrete floor, an ESD chair on a concrete floor may provide you additional protection. Okay, containers. We want to avoid really, really conductive containers because we've talked about how metal can have problems. Um, if you have dissipative uh, tweezer tips, so if you're going to be touching the leaves on something that's sensitive, uh, you won't throw a spark to it. That, that's ideal. Um, sometimes you don't have the strength you need and tool tips to do it with a dissipated material, especially with tweezers. I mean, with screwdrivers, you only have a metal tip. Um, they can be very problematic. Uh, you can get dissipated handles. You can also dip um, standard tools in a rubber solution that is dissipative, just make sure it comes over the handle and makes contact to the metal. And now at least you are, if a grounded person is holding it, the tip of that is not isolated where it could get um, charged up. So just ensure it, there's, it's possible to have reliable grounding um, of your tools and your product. So here's a picture of, uh, we've got trays that it turned out were very, were too conductive, 
So we've got boards sitting on these trays. The trays are not on a grounded mat at all, so this is a, another example of what not to do. But you often see things like this in, in areas. And you notice the, the big circuit board on the side is just placed on top of um, the tray that was actually designed for the little circuit boards as if you know it's a work surface. And any horizontal surface will turn into a work surface uh, with creative people. They will put things down on anything. So any place that you suspect a sensitive component can be put down should be covered with a, a ground mat. Another related question, Ginger, or slightly, well, I guess it's related. How critical is it to ensure insulators that are, uh, that are uh, charged to 125 volts or higher, how critical is it for them to be uh, kept at least an inch away? You know, some of these guidelines in the standards were developed uh, by committee, and it's a rule of thumb. Obviously, you would want to make sure you have the most protection possible for your devices in your uh, work area. So um, having a greater margin to make sure that you're protected, I think, is the way to go. Not, you know, we talked about the 12-inch keep-out zone. Does that mean at 11 and a half inches you can't have something? Or, you know, it, obviously it's a rule of thumb to give you some uh, confidence that your setup is going to work most of the time. So in this picture, we're, we're looking at a JETIC tray, which a lot of uh, chips and devices are moved around on. These are not always made to the best um, quality control. Uh, sometimes the same tray will have hot spots that are too conductive, and then they'll have places where they're basically insulators. And if you stack up a bunch of these trays on a table, the top trays are probably isolated from ground. They're not getting any benefit from being on a grounded work mat. Remember, one of, the, one of the purposes of the grounded workstation is to drain charge off of product so that it can be handled safely. And if it's isolated and floating, an operator can reach over and pick it up and perhaps discharge it. So um, this is, this, trays can be a problem. Uh, so measure them, even when you have a good source, do spot sampling. Sometimes they can lose the recipe, and you can get a bad batch of trays. And with metal tools, um, you're really concentrating the risk of reaching in and touching something sensitive. And if the operator is not grounded or if those gloves are insulating, uh, you can have a problem. So that's why if you can use a dissipative tip on a tweezer, that gives you a better uh, protection. Now this is a very interesting uh, example. We had a client that had a problem and doing re root cause analysis of the charge device model damage that they were getting on, and boards are more susceptible to uh, damage than individual devices. A lot of people don't realize that. Um, it's easier to touch the metal trace on a board and, and there's greater capacitance so you can actually do more damage once your components are on a circuit board. In this case, as we mentioned, screwdrivers uh, can be a problem. The handle was very uh, insulating, and just by moving it, especially if you had gloves on, by moving the handle, you, uh, 1,000 volts were on the handle, which induced a charge in the tip. Uh, we had 28 volts on the metal tip, and we're able to measure a with a current probe, we had up to 7 amp discharge, and that indeed was what was causing the problem on the board. Is there anything you want to add to that, Ted? No, except that we were we were amazed at the the, the magnitude of the discharge currents. Um, Terry Walsher and I did this um, in in the lab, and to get you know up to a 7 amp discharge from a screwdriver tip was mind boggling, but. Um, after visiting several sites for this company, uh, this was the root cause. This risk was in several different places throughout the process, and we were getting discharges with event detectors in the various uh, manufacturing facilities, and really has, in my case, personally changed my 
understanding of the level of risk that these screwdrivers and tools with insulated handles cause. It's a much greater risk than, than we thought. And if you see that, that handle there, if you take this plain old screwdriver and dip it in this dissipative rubber so that it goes over the handle and touches the tip, you've now the tip, not the, all the way to the tip, just to the shaft of the screwdriver, um, now you've got a way to make sure that a metal tip is not isolated and generating a big charge. Very interesting study, by the way. It took quite a bit of effort to pin this down. So we're going to speak very briefly about ionization. We do have an entire webinar that's been recorded that's available on our website about ionization. Uh, so the first item, to, if you're being practical, is you want to save money, decide if you really need ionization. They, they're expensive and they need to be maintained. You can tell we don't sell products because we're always telling you what you don't need to buy. But um, you can determine if, if an ionizer is needed. You can use event detectors. You can use field meters, see if things are charged up. If you can get dissipative materials in your area so that you don't have uh, necessary in, uh, insulators that need to be uh, ionized, then that would be better. Get something that dissipates. Uh, so ionization is a last resort. If you uh, do overkill, that can be a problem. Often people think, well, I'll just buy ionizers and put them everywhere. But ionizers have to be monitored. They have to be cleaned. They have to be tested. If they get out of balance, they can actually charge things up. So nothing's free. <laughs> Yeah, you have to know what you're doing and what you need. And but if you need an ionizer, there are some selection characterizations. There's a, you know AC and DC. You can have them at the bench. You can have them overhead. You can do the whole room, which is often used for um, contamination control. Sorry, I got. Like I said, we have a whole um, a whole webinar on ionization. So, is there anything else that we can add, ask here or answer? Uh, we do have, a, actually it goes back to the chair again, a question. Okay. If I'm using an ESD chair, will that provide grounding for the employee? Uh, surprisingly good grounding. It, um, you know, you, we, actually, we actually have a couple of clients in Asia that um, have gone to great lengths to uh, specify grounding strictly with the chair, no wrist strap. I, we don't advocate that. But uh, yeah, the chair provides surprisingly good ground and good backup coverage, uh, which comes in and handy. And actually, Ted, and as you said, sometimes in an engineering lab where the, uh, it may be difficult to get compliance with wearing wrist straps, uh, a, an ESD chair and perhaps an ESD carpet or an ESD floor will give you a baseline of confidence that generally you've got ESD under control. If you're hire, handling a high volume of products like the workers in an assembly area are, definitely you want them to have wrist straps. But sometimes it, it, it's difficult in some areas where they're not always uh, handling sensitive devices. And if you have the chairs and the floor there, then and, and, and the work surface, that gives you a, a pretty good, probably 90% confidence that you've got things controlled. Okay. And you don't have to have ESD garments to connect to the chair. Most people make very good contact with their chairs. A little flashback question. How often okay. do wrist and heel straps need to be tested? I don't know how you'd respond to that, Ginger, but I'd say it depends. It depends on how heavy the usage is. Generally, in manufacturing, it's a minimum of once a day. But if you have... Yeah, often it's whenever they go into the work area, the ESD-controlled yeah. area. Yeah, that's another scenario. Lots of ways of doing it. The key thing is to validate with uh, statistical sampling of your process, so you can determine. So often the way, go ahead, Ken. No, go ahead. You go. I mean, often the way we answer that question is, well, how much product do you are you willing to throw away if you find out the wrist trap was bad? Okay. Let's go on to the next one. So this is an example of the kinds of things if you're going to do a visual inspection. It doesn't, you know, a simple line that indicates that the benchtop ionizer is rotated properly to sweep over the work area. You know, just draw a line and you can tell at a glance that this is not aligned properly. Also, the, the tape on the work mat 
shows you where the ionizer should be placed because the air only the ions blow with the air and if um, if it's a hot day and, and these have turned into personal cooling devices and the, it's blowing on the worker instead of the, the work, then the ions aren't getting where they need to go. So by having some visual cues, it can be uh, very easy for the daily visual checks by the, the worker and the supervisor to make sure that the, the proper procedures are being followed. We had one question about getting a copy of the presentation. Uh, it will be available on the website as a, a, re, a fully recorded webinar. So some closing thoughts. Um, a a well-designed grounded workstation is, is the building block. It's where you start to, to build a component, uh, to build a successful ESD control program. It, it's the main component. And of course, you need to qualify the products that you're using um, initially to make sure that you've selected the best materials that are going to give you the, the best use for the longest period of time. And the daily inspection, visual inspections are very important. We often say that your eyes and your brains are your best diagnostic tools. Um, it, of course, you do need other meters and to test, uh, do internal audits and compliance verification on a regular basis is necessary to make sure your program is working effectively. Actually, uh, this I, is a pick. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, I was just going to say that we just had a perfect timing for a question. We just had one asking, can you explain how to perform the walking test? And I'll let you answer that. Uh, we didn't put it in this presentation because it, it was, um, there were so many things we could have put in. But basically, you walk, you're holding a, a, um, a probe and walking in a pattern that just, that uh, is a simplified pattern. It's going to be a shuffle. It doesn't really matter what it is, but it's emulating a person walking point to point at their workstation. And you look at peaks. You see how, how much you charge. And uh, if you have a wrist strap on, you're not going to see very much charge at all. That's good. If you don't have a wrist strap, you will see that with each step, as an operator steps, and generally we'll take three or four steps and then pause, so you can see what no charging is, and take three or four steps and then pause. Uh, by the way, a wireless wrist strap is exactly the same as wearing no wrist strap when you do this test. So if you have any doubts that it, that it, it can work, you can verify it. Uh, is there anything else about the, the walking voltage, Ted, that well, you want to say? That, uh, this the, we're showing you an image of our website, and we have these ah, yes. videos there. And one of them shows you exactly how to, not exactly, but it, it shows you the test method for walking, walking voltage. It's number nine. Nine number on nine. that list. So it's and a little video of, of Ted demonstrating how to do it, and you can see the waveform that's generated. So uh, here are some little you know, short video clips. They're all educational in nature. Um, over here on the right uh, is the, I mentioned that we have once a year a workshop here in, um, in Massachusetts, near North Shore of Boston. Uh, and this link here in the red zone, the event zone, uh, keep an eye on that. We'll be updating it uh, as we develop the curriculum for this year, although last year's is a good illustration of what to expect. See here now. Uh, let me. I guess we can go to. Yeah, I think. No, I think that's. That there's just one left. Yep. Yep. And I want to thank you very much for attending. Uh, the one thing I miss doing with these webinars is I I don't get to see people's faces. Um, and I hope that the topics that we've covered have been of value and some of the. Practical considerations will help you making your um, decisions about how to control static in your area. If you have any questions, we're here to help. And I really appreciate you being here. And I guess, Ted, if there are any more questions that you want to handle now, we could do that. Yeah, we have a couple. I do want to say that uh, I've tried to answer as many as we could. And, um, we really couldn't get into all of them. but. Um, before I do that, I just wanted to say in the beginning I told you we had 125 
sign up with a seat capacity of 101, and we had 98 show up. So we, we lucked out. Nobody was turned away. Um, let's see. Let me just, I'm going to scan through the questions again and just see if there's any that we can try to answer at this point. Uh, those that we have not answered, we will respond uh, to the individuals that uh, requested it. Ted, do you want to try and do you want to try and show that video too? If anyone's still on and wants to see it, maybe. Yeah, we could try that again if you like, and uh, I'll. Uh, I mean, it's a short video; it's just a couple minutes, but I think it, it right. demonstrates draining charge, and it works so much better on a soft surface than a hard surface. Yeah, let me try that again and see how we do. In this video, we'll see the difference in charge removal between hard tabletops and soft mats and discuss the difference this makes to an ESD control program. To measure this difference, we start with a conductive metal disc with an insulating handle and a plastic disc that's used to charge it. We also use a field meter to measure the voltage on the disc. When we place the disc on a hard dissipative tabletop, we measure approximately 11,000 volts and the charge decays very slowly. Okay, and what if you leave it a little longer? Like five seconds or something? By contrast, when we place the disc on a soft dissipative mat, the charge is drained off almost instantly. Now you do the same thing on a rubber or vinyl mat. Let's examine why this difference occurs. If we were to look at the electrical contact microscopically, uh, we would see that the hard surface is making contact in only a few places, making charge transfer slow and inefficient. By contrast, area. the soft mat flattens to make nearly continuous contact, mat, allowing rapid charge connection. removal. Note that the disc is at approximately 6,000 volts before and after contact with the hard tabletop. By contrast, the voltage drops quickly to zero as soon as it makes contact with the soft mat. Okay. Pretty much the same process, and it's dramatically better. That's why uh, there's a question in the survey about specifying soft materials for class zero. From a practical standpoint, soft table mats have been found to be very important. It was a great turnout. We appreciate your support and welcome any questions as we go forward. And again, the questions that we were unable to answer, we'll respond to the individuals that asked them. Thanks very much, and have a great day. Have a great day. Thank you.